thank you as you're coming in uh, and getting ready for our next panel. I just want to talk to you for a moment before we introduce our guests and have a conversation about Medicaid reform, about why Medicaid and Medicaid reform needs to be such a critical priority um, for policymakers, taxpayers, moment. and patients. You know, most of us realize that Medicaid is the number one line item in every state budget. And over the last decade, it's the only share of spe state spending that's actually grown, while K-12 education, corrections, yeah, transportation, sure. economic development, they've all shrunk as a share of state spending. And even at the federal level, Medicaid is the fastest growing entitlement, which will consume about half the federal deficit over the next decade. So from a taxpayer perspective, we certainly understand that Medicaid and solving Medicaid is key to every other public policy priority that we have. But most importantly, Medicaid reform is critical because of the patient. And if we don't have Medicaid working, then we can't give patients the hope of a better life that comes through better access to health care and improved health. And so that's really what market-based Medicaid reform is all about. It has to be pro-patient and pro-taxpayer. It has to be sustainable for all of us as taxpayers, but more importantly, it has to take a patient who's poor and sick, give him or her access to health care, and then give them the hope of a better life to become healthy and to experience all of the things that all of us want with better health and to ultimately transition off Medicaid. This panel is a conversation looking at Medicaid reform from every perspective, from a policymaker, from a Medicaid director, and from those on the front line, somebody receiving a Medicaid benefit. And I hope with this conversation that you'll join in and be part of in just a few minutes, that this will take an issue that too many of us find is removed and not applicable and make it very personal, and hopefully for the policymakers in this room, make it a priority for you for this upcoming legislative session. What I'd like to do at this time uh, is introduce uh, two members of our panel. I also have being distributed just a one-pager on Georgia Medicaid, Medicaid reform, and we're looking forward at the Foundation for Government Accountability to working closely with Kelly and the foundation here to really advance Medicaid reform uh, in 2014 here in Georgia. First, I'm very pleased to be introduced by Carol Steckel, who most recently was the director of Medicaid in North Carolina. Carol? And my own state representative, State Representative Matt Hudson from Naples, Florida. Matt has the distinction of also chairing the Healthcare Appropriations Committee. This man's in charge of $31 billion in the state of Florida. <laughs> and third, I'd like to introduce you to one of the bravest young men I know, but also a man who's become a friend, Moise Brutus. And I think the best way to get to know Moise is to see a video about his life. Life growing up was pretty good. What I can remember was, you know, what every child would imagine their child to be like. Until October 11, 2010, I was in a really bad motorcycle accident where I had a less than a 1% chance of survival. I woke up from a coma three days later, looked down, man, I couldn't believe it. My legs were gone. My name is Moise Brutus, and I'm a triple amputee. First thing I said was, oh my God, my life is over. For about six months, I just stayed in a dark room and never left. At my lowest point, I was about 76 pounds. And my mom, she lost all hope. To me, I had two choices, either stay in clinical depression for the rest of my life or go out there and be everything I can be. I made the decision to not let this accident define who I would become. At that time, I had also met Catherine Martinez from WellCare, who went out of her way to give me everything I needed. Catherine and I, with the help of providers, were able to get me the prosthetics I needed to get my life back. I started going to amputee support groups, which helped my morale a lot. Just around the time I got in touch with Catherine, another big change happened. I got Dexter, my best buddy in the whole world. 
When I got him, we were out around the block every afternoon when the sun went down. And that was the start of it all. I also started doing outpatient rehab. And that's when I started venturing out of my comfort zone. One day at therapy, one of my therapists decided to put me on a stationary bike. I remember the whole room went quiet because everybody thought I wasn't gonna be able to do it. I work out five times a week. I cycle about 100 miles a week. I go to school and I'm totally independent. My life today is amazing. I'm currently training for the 2016 Paralympic cycling team. When I'm on the bike, I feel like the wind. I feel free. I feel like I have no disability. I never thought that going through something so traumatic would lead to so many good things. Whenever I had any doubts, I've always had the support of many who pushed me through it. Someone said that the brightest lights come from the darkest places, and this is so true. Because this past year, I learned so many lessons. Even though I have so much more road to travel, this chapter of me getting back on my feet is almost done. I feel like my foundation is set for me to accomplish anything I want to. Moise, it's great to have you here. Thank um, you. Thank you. As I mentioned in the video, October 11th is a big day. And today is the three-year anniversary of your accident. It is. Take us back three years. What um, happened? You want me to explain what happened? Um, pretty much, um, I don't really like to, like, it's taking me back. Uh, give me one second. Um, all right, so my mom had just got back from vacation. And uh, I get a call from one of my friends. He was like, hey, we're going to go out for a ride. You want to come? And this particular friend, I had let him down a couple of times before, and uh, I didn't really want to let him down this time. So I decided to go, uh, put on all my gear, headed out. Mom, I'll be back. Uh, Mom's like, no, don't go. Stay. I should listen, but I didn't. Um, and then I went out, and uh, all I remember was seeing like a white wall when I decided to take the exit to go home. Um, and then I just remember waking up in a ditch. Um, Look down, this leg's gone, this one looks like a pretzel, this arm was gone. Okay, my life is over. Um, how am I gonna get out of this situation? Uh, you, have a, you had a phone, had to find the phone, called 911, hello, I was in a bad motorcycle accident, my arm is missing. Uh, about 15 minutes later, I hear sirens, but I can also hear panic in the dispatcher's voice. So I'm like, okay, they can't find me. Um, that time I started feeling really, really weak and sleepy. Um, and uh, she made a point to try to keep me calm and uh, so I wouldn't fall asleep. Um, another 15 minutes go by, they still couldn't find me. At that time, I told them I hear and I see sirens coming from my right. Uh, if you guys, if they come to their left, they'll find me. A minute later, they found me. Put the tourniquets on, that's when the pain started. Worst pain ever. Uh, took me to the hospital. Remember this one nurse, she kept asking me all these questions. I'm like, put me out, put me out. But she just kept asking me questions. Had to yell at her a couple of times to put me out. <laughs> um, they finally, they put me out. And uh, remember, they tried waking me up like periodically just to, I don't know, access my, I don't know, my brain function or whatever. Um, but I just wasn't calm enough for them to keep me up because I kept asking, did they put me back together? Um, and uh, on the third day, I, they woke me up, and I saw my mom, and um, that's pretty much where it all started. You know, one of the things, given your experience in Miami, Miami-Dade County was in the process of transitioning through Medicaid reform at this time. And so you had the experience of being in old Medicaid for a period of time before being in a reformed private plan in Medicaid. Can you talk a little bit about the difference of what care was like when you're in old Medicaid uh, and how you interacted with patients and contrast that to your relationship in a private plan where the incentives are focused on improving your health and a little bit about Catherine. Um, well, in my opinion, um, the old Medi Medicaid, you know, it's, I feel like 
you know, like you're just another number, um, pretty much. And I mean, I don't, I don't even think it's, it's, it's really their fault because they have so many cases and, um, you know, there's so many people. Um, you know, everybody has their own problems. Um, during that time, um, my mom, she's not a nurse, but she's like a, she's something close to a nurse, I think like a CPN or, or something like that. And at that time, you know, my mom had to change like my, my wounds and stuff because um, I didn't get anyone to come and, uh, and remove them. You know, like it, it, was, it was really, really bad. Um, and um, and uh, when, when I sort of transitioned to well care, um, and um, you know, it almost didn't happen because I remember Catherine, um, which uh, she deserves some credit for me being here today. Um, she made it her incentive, and she worked for well care. She made it her incentive to get in, in contact with me and my mom because at that time I wasn't picking up any of my phone calls. Um, I was in a really, really bad uh, mental state. I would just sleep all day. Um, and I guess she read my case files once everything got transferred over to WellCare. She read my uh, case files and uh, she made it a real interest to, uh, to be proactive. And um, since she couldn't contact me, she contacted my mom. And uh, moms being moms, uh, my mom was able to explain everything to her. Um, and uh, she made it her number one priority to uh, get me everything I needed. And you know, that right there made so much difference because I think the ultimate goal is, you know, of course, you know, one of the, one of the jobs of government is to provide health care for, for, for the nation's population. But I mean, you don't want everybody to be, you know, like on Medicaid or else taxes are going to have to go up. And uh, no one wants that. I mean, I don't really know all the political terms and stuff, but just from, just from my point of view, I feel like, you know, Medicaid, food stamps, and all that other stuff, it's sort of like a, like, a, like a cushion blanket for like when something goes bad, which um, nine times out of 10 it will, just something to, you know, keep you going until you figure out that next step. And, um, you know, for me, this is my third year um, training for the Paralympics, I'm going to school. You know, I'm not going to be on this thing forever. You know, like it's, it's, for me, it's just, you know, it's just like, you know, for me, it's just like a cushion for me to finish my schooling and uh, go back to the job market, um, you know, and start paying taxes again to help uh, our other fellow Americans. And the way WellCare was able to do that is because old Medicaid is sort of like, they give you a list of things that you're able to get. And everybody's different. Like, I'm different, I'm really active, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. So something that works for someone who's 67 might not necessarily work for me. And WellCare realized that because um, one of my legs, I kept, you know, breaking them because of my activity level. And every couple months, they would have to shell out approximately $15,000 every couple months because I kept breaking it. And what they were able to realize is that, okay, so if we get him a better leg, which costs maybe, I don't know, 50 or 30,000, you know, we'll be able to save this much money throughout the whole year because he won't be breaking this, this leg every couple months or so. Um, and you know, WellCare and I guess the other companies sort of realize that and they sort of have like an individualized plan where they can assess your situation and with a, you know, with a doctor you know, that's overseeing everything is able to make recommendations on, on what's really best for the patients, for them to uh, go out there and uh, figure their lives out and uh, go back to the uh, to, to workforce, I guess. So Moise, you were telling me you're one class away from getting your associates in chemistry, well, which I can't even begin to tell you. Two classes. Oh, two classes, sorry. <laughs> so I, I don't even want to tell you how I did in chemistry. Um, and you're training for the 2016 Paralympics. I am. We have a room full of policymakers who are considering taking on what it really is a big public policy challenge, Medicaid reform. So given what you've gone through, what would you say to the policymakers in this room uh, to encourage them to take on this big public policy challenge? I would just say that there are probably like, you know, like, you know, thousands of other people just like me out there. You know, all they really need is just like, you know, just like a little boost. And um, if they're able to get the things that they need and, uh, you know, get the care that they need, you know, like I'm sure, 
you know, like sooner or later, the state will have a lot of uh, healthy, young, maybe even old, just, you know, working people back at, on the workforce. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. And just try it, you know, like if it doesn't work, you can always go back to the old one, but just try the new one. Thanks, Moise. No problem. Thank you. Welcome. Carol, it's great. Carol, I know it's people like Moist that keep you going every day in the work that you do. Uh, you've most recently served as the Medicaid director in North Carolina, but prior to that, you were Bobby Jindal's uh, health coordinator for responding to the Affordable Care Act, also directed Medicaid in Alabama. Talk to us a little bit about what you tackled in North Carolina with pro uh, in setting up the partnership and how you were focused on that reform and why. And it's exciting to, to actually meet a young man. Now, Moise is 23 years old. Amazing, isn't it? I, I think about the strength, the courage, the stamina to go through something horrific like he did and to be an advocate. Um, and understanding the pressures that you have in a Medicaid program, both financially and organizationally. So in North Carolina, in most states, and you all are doing a good bit of this work here in Georgia, but you look at an evolution of the system, and, and it's the old engineering adage is you get what you designed. Well, when we paid for fee-for-service, we got exactly what we designed. We paid for a lot of office visits. We paid for a lot of x-rays. We paid for a lot of hospitalizations. And none of it was coordinated, and none of it was focused on an individual in a holistic way. So if you fast forward through some experiments of, of what we call PCCM, or patient-centered medical homes that coordinated some of the primary care services, then you started capitating and organizing pieces of care, like in North Carolina, we have a capitated system for behavioral health, and we've got a primary care case management system that looks at primary care, but nothing is coordinated across those two spectrums, and then nothing is coordinated when it comes to specialty services. So the partnership for a healthy North Carolina that the governor announced in April is the idea of how do you take it to that ultimate level? and much what Moise is talking about, that a lot of times you become very short-sighted looking at a $15,000 leg and that's all we can pay for. Well, if it's breaking and he's not able to live the highest level of his life with that, it's worth it both the quality of life and the budget to give him that $30,000 leg or $45,000 leg. It's what I call a no-brainer because it improves his life, it improves his outcomes, and it saves the, the budget of the Medicaid program. So that's the concept behind the partnership of, of, for Healthy North Carolina. The idea, and I, I spent some time with Moyes last night, but listening to him talk about the fact that he's off all medications, he hasn't been to the emergency department in a very long time, he hasn't been in the hospital, those are all, I mean, when I put on my green eye shade as a former Medicaid director, those are all wins for me because it saves me money across that board. But more importantly, you have a young man who's making a success out of his life, and that will be back into the, the job market, will be back into the economy, and that's what we should all be about. And so you're seeing the Medicaid programs, both in North Carolina and across the country, moving into that. How do we focus the services that we provide on an individual and do what's best for that individual? It is a win-win for everybody, including the, the state and the federal government. So it, it's an exciting initiative. And when you have success stories as dramatic as Moy's, it, it makes it a, a very exciting time. And to be clear, I think, to the audience, what you're doing in North Carolina and what Representative Hudson will talk about in Florida is rather than that old Medicaid kind of one-size-fits-none approach, you're really setting up this marketplace of several different private plans, all with the incentives to not just control costs, but more importantly, improve health. So you, as a Medicaid director, aren't playing doctor, but instead you're managing a marketplace that works for patients. 
Ex exactly. In, in the linkage, it, it's one of those aha moments that you think, how stupid are we that we didn't catch on a long time ago? But just think of the basic link between behavioral health, mental health services, and physical health. When someone goes into an emergency room nowadays, eight out of ten times, it's because of a mental health issue. Well, if we start linking that, and, and I met with met hundreds of family members of children, adult children with um, IDD, intellectual disabilities, and they tell me at the end of the day they're so tired just trying to get services for their child that they can't even think of either their health or their child's health. Well, and, and then you create a cycle where they're, they're going down the drain, so to speak, and nobody is winning and you end up spending a significant amount of money or a child, an adult child could be at home, ends up in an institution which is not good for anybody. So looking at an individual and what they need instead of that one size fits all is where you create that win-win-win situation. You improve someone's life, you save money on the budget, and you've got a better program that's a higher quality program. And that's the, the opportunity, and, and today is my first official day at WellCare, so I'm, I'm very proud to hear of the good work we're doing. But as Moe said, there are also other companies that are doing good work, not as good as WellCare, but, um, <laughs> but are doing good work, but it's that delinking from Medicaid to that private sector, to the, the marketplace that can create these programs, incentives for recipients to improve their health, to be involved in their health care decisions. That's what's exciting about what we're about, both at Medicaid and the, the private managed care plans that, that exist. And how much is North Carolina going to save as a result of this reform? Well, the interesting thing is that North Carolina, the governor decided that it wasn't going to be a budget exercise. So what we were going to do is as we set the rates for the capitated plans, we were going to move in all the cost. Now what that meant is for North Carolina, we were going to decrease the increase in cost of Medicaid. And we were looking at being able to, to with the, the term is lower the cost curve, and we were looking at 8 to 10 percent at a minimum of what we were going to be able to do. And for, in dollar terms, what is that? It's a, it's a $13 billion budget, so we were talking about over a billion dollars. So. Give us in one is year. the final question before we move on to Representative Hudson. You know, as a Medicaid director, I love that you're so uh, focused on innovation and reform because typically in a lot of states where we work with policymakers, sometimes, and I'm not saying this is the case in Georgia, but oftentimes it's the Medicaid director and what we call sort of the Medicaid industrial complex that can be the roadblock to that reform. Talk, if you were talking directly to the lawmakers in the room, how would you talk to them about working with the industrial complex of the status quo and also the Medicaid director to really focus on this pro-patient, pro-taxpayer reform? Well, you all are very fortunate to have an extraordinary Medicaid director in Jerry Dubberly. He is a, a progressive thinker. He's an innovator and, and actually came up through the ranks so he understands both the day-to-day -day pressures of Medicaid but he also works on a national level with other Medicaid directors. Um, so the key, the, the thing I would encourage everybody to remember is that most people, Medicaid is like any other organization, your organizations. You have good people, you have bad people, but by and large, most of the people that come to work at Medicaid, they come to work because they know whether they're a secretary or whether they're the director of the program, that the work that they're doing every single day makes somebody's life better. And that's an awesome responsibility and an awesome joy and benefit. So keep that in mind as you're doing that. The other thing too is there is not another industry that I could think of that is changing as rapidly as Medicaid. And the pressures both from the federal government and from the states, from the general assemblies and the legislatures. Um, but the other thing is to understand that and to make sure you're asking questions about what can you do at the state level, what can you not do? Because a lot of times what I found is it was a misunderstanding that what we wanted, what somebody wanted to do, we wanted to do, but the federal government wouldn't let us do it. So then we joined together and worked with Congress to make a change. So there's a lot of that kind of understanding that has to go on. 
The other thing, too, is to understand that they're running, I don't remember what Georgia's budget is, but in North Carolina, I had a $13 billion budget. Well, that's what, a Fortune 100, 200 company? So you have the day-to-day -day activities, which are enormous, in addition to try to think ahead under this environment where you've got the um, prepaid health, there, the the PPACA, Obamacare, ACA, whatever you call it, and then you have the changes going on in the state budgets. So understanding that dynamic that you've got someone that's trying to keep their feet both in the day-to-day -day operations so the train's running on time and trying to think ahead in an ever-changing environment. Um, but, but work with your Medicaid director and, and understand the the I tell people that once you start understanding Medicaid, they change all the rules. So we're in the middle of the changing all the rules period. So you won't ever understand it completely. But the more you talk and the more you dialogue and the more you work together, the better you're able to do some very innovative, creative things that can be done through the Medicaid program. It's just not easy. It's not fast. And it's um, sometimes extremely frustrating. But if you stick to it, it can be done. And, and you all here in Georgia are doing a good bit of that. And I, I'm excited about going to Florida and, and joining that effort and, and hope in North Carolina we'll, we'll be moving forward also. Thanks, Carol. Thank you. Representative Hudson, it's great to be having this conversation with you. Not only do you chair the Healthcare Appropriations Committee, but you're also the vice chair of the legislature's select PPACA or Obamacare Committee. So you really understand health policy from a lot of different angles. Can you talk to us a bit about Florida's Medicaid reform and setting up this marketplace? Uh, and again, talking to the policymakers in the room about the politics and priorities of Medicaid reform in Florida. Well, thank you, Taryn. And it's uh, very nice to be here. And I love it when I get the easy questions like that. Um, <laughs> Let me There's just, other ones. Yeah, I, I, I sense that, yes. Um, let me just tell you, um, for Florida, we started this initiative back in 2004 under then-Governor Jeb Bush to create a pilot program to look at how we fix Medicaid. Now, I will tell you that if all of you here thought for a moment and you thought about four words that would least describe government, you could probably say creative, innovative, effective, transformational. None of those things normally apply, right? I think we would all safely say that. And yet, that's what we were looking at when it came to our Medicaid reform. How would we completely change the paradigm? Everybody talks about costs, cost curves, and all that. But at the end of the day, if you don't focus on what's truly important, then it really, all those other things don't matter. So we focus solely on the patient, reckoning that if we focused on the patient, all the other things would come. And so uh, in 2005, we put forward a pilot program with five counties, um, learned a lot from the pilot, like pilots are supposed to do. We did some things right, did some things wrong. I mean, that's why you have a pilot, for Pete's sake. Uh, and we, we, te we tested it in a very urbanized area in Broward County, has 11% of our state's population, so a significant number of folks in that county, 1.9 million. Um, and we tested in some rural counties as well, so we could kind of get a, a, a sense for how it would play across all 67 of our counties. Uh, we then launched an initiative in 2010 to go ahead and learn from our mistakes and roll it out uh, uh, statewide. We passed that, um, and uh, <clears throat> our good friends at the federal government um, managed to take three years to approve our, uh, our plan. Um, I'm not sure if that's a record, but I'm reasonably close that it's got uh, to be in the hunt. So during that period of time, we had kind of a quasi Five, pilot th five county thing going on, and 62 other counties in old Medicaid. Needless to say, uh, that's not what we were shooting for. So from a policymaker standpoint, um, when we were going through this process, uh, I think the most important thing you can do is recognize that you've got to focus on that patient. Focus all your discussions on that patient. Because at the end of the day, the Medicaid program, as Moise so aptly point out, is just a cushion. It's just a cushion to get you through a period of time until you can move back into the workforce, move back into your life, and so forth. It's not meant to be there forever. And so for us, we said, let's focus on the patient. Let's do some things that will allow that patient to actually get well. I mean, the point of health care is actually health. And oftentimes, that seems to be the one word that is missing in all of those discussions. And Certainly, the Affordable Care Act doesn't do anything for that, but that's probably another conference that we'll talk about later. Um, 
And so at the end of the day, focus on those things. And when you do that, you'll, you'll find that you're looking for creative, innovative things. You're looking for uh, the patient's ability to now have a choice in health plans. My goodness. I would, I would venture to say that when you go out to the mall this week and uh, you want to go clothes shopping and you go to Macy's or Dillard's or Belk's or Penny's, if all they had was chartreuse shirts, that'd be a problem, wouldn't it? Because I don't see a lot of chartreuse in the room. No offense. So you can't make it one size fit all. It's got to be tailored to the individual. One size fit all doesn't work for clothing. It doesn't work for people. Sometimes one size fit all doesn't work for clothing and people either. <laughs> So from a practical standpoint, you've got to give people choice. And when you do that, good things happen. You find that people are willing to be innovative and creative and look for realistic solutions that, you know what, make a difference in a person's life. What we also encouraged was that innovation say, OK, you have a special situation. You have chronic um, uh, mental illness, severe mental illness. Well, you know what? Um, we don't want you to have to go from this plan to that plan to this plan to this provider to that provider to this provider. We'll let you create a specialty plan within the Medicaid program so that that person with a severe mental illness problem, you know what, they're going to not only take care of this, they're going to take care of the rest of you. And now you've, you've got somebody that's looking at the total comprehensive person. I haven't talked about money at all, but you can kind of see that there's inherently going to be a benefit financially, but there's a bigger benefit to the individual. So from a policy discussion, talk about people, because that's really the business we're in. Frankly, we're in a republic, and you wouldn't be here as a policymaker without them. And so focus on that, and all the rest will come. Just uh, talking a little bit, Florida's rolled out the long-term care uh, reform, moving everyone into this marketplace of private plans. You highlighted the specialty plans available to certain individuals, lots of choice. Uh, just the state has announced the contracts for the private plans for everyone else in Medicaid. Can you talk about a little bit about how the benefits in those private plans look different than old Medicaid? Yeah, um, and that's a great question because, uh, as Moise alluded to, th before there was a list. And you have that list. Uh, you have that list when you're talking about that during the budget cycle. Oh, we're going to cover this, we're going to cover that, we're going to cover this. Oh, if we cover that, we're only going to give them these benefits and, and so forth. I mean, that, that is part of the, the structural process we go through. So instead of that, if you're focused on the patient, you say, okay, you want to bid on a plan and you want to be a provider. Fantastic. That's great. You got to cover all this stuff because, hey, that's what we're, we're in the business to do because we have this agreement with the federal government to be able to get our match funds, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now, what else are you going to do? What are you going to do to be able to take care of that patient so that we get health outcomes? I'm not talking about your profit. What are we going to do to get health outcomes? And suddenly they go, well, we're going to add some other things because we know that oral health is important. Oral health drives a lot of people to the emergency room with bad teeth and fillings and all those kinds of problems, right? So when they let the contracts, uh, we have 10, uh, 10 different uh, groups, and nine of those contractors are going to provide expanded adult dental services to the recipients. They didn't ask for more money to do that because we told them we weren't giving them more money to do that. They recognized that if they did that on a per capitated fee, that if they improved the health of that person, the financial side would come. We also found that they improved and expanded uh, vision uh, programs for people. Because if you can't see, you're going to be a little difficult to go back to work. Um, we also saw um, very creative things. Uh, one of the plans even is offering equine therapy. I'm not sure why you would need equine therapy, but apparently it's available. But that's the level of creativity that we're talking about. Because at the end of the day, it's about that person. If that's what that person needs to get over the hump, and you're willing to do that for the price that we're willing to pay you, OK. Because that's what it should be, focused on that patient, and all the good will come from that. The providers win, the patient wins, the state wins. And frankly, uh, at the end of the day, we've got more people productive doing the good stuff for the state of Florida. So Representative, if you're improving Medicaid and making it so much better, then why don't you expand the program like uh, the president wants you to? Well, he and I oddly haven't talked on that directly. Um, I know that he's probably been working on a website. Give I, him a little I, break. I know, I know. I, I'm waiting for an email anytime. Um, I was the guy in Florida that made the uh, motion not to expand Medicaid, um, which made me pretty wildly popular with some groups. You can you can probably well imagine. 
The practical side is this. Until you have a functioning program that is focused on what it should be focused on, health outcomes, then there is absolutely no rational reason to expand the program. If you have a program that doesn't have enough practitioners and providers, then giving somebody a card means absolutely nothing. Now, in the great state of Georgia, I think it's a safe bet you might have a few rural, maybe agrarian communities. Anybody want to acknowledge that? Yeah, OK. <laughs> Guess what? So do we in Florida. Now, we're the fourth most populous state, 19.3 million people. But I have eight counties without a hospital. I have two counties without doctors, three counties without dentists, 17 counties without a pediatrician, 21 counties without a psychologist, and 33 counties without an ophthalmologist. So the idea, number one, that you would make somebody have health care when they have nowhere to go to get it, make an employer provide health care when they have nowhere to get it, make me expand a program where I can't give somebody access to it is ludicrous. And more importantly, I'm not going to expand a program that, frankly, is not working as well as it needs to until we get it completely rolled out. And I'm certainly not going to roll, expand it then either. But at the end of the day, you've got to think realistically. Forget the political pressure. There will always be those naysayers that say, oh, no, you've got to do it. You've got to take care of you know, this person, that person, this person. You know what? That's a false hope. That's worse. That's absolutely worse. Not to mention, you know, may have noticed, I don't know if you saw the newspaper that was sitting in front of the door this morning, but we've got a little fiscal crisis in D.C. I don't know if anybody noticed that or not. I did. The notion that somehow we would actually believe that the federal government in this fiscal climate could put forward a 10-year funding formula and stick to it? Seriously? If they cut that rate by 1% in Florida to my taxpayers, that's $187 million that I would have to pony up on a 1% de minimis cut. I'm not willing to do that to the state of Florida. It's not right. Thanks, Representative. We now want to open it up to all of you. Uh, we have a great panel here, the conversations about Medicaid reform. So just raise your hand. The mic will come around. And feel free to ask a question of any of our panelists. Yes, sir. Thank you. A question uh, as respects what you've done in Florida. Can you just state your name at the I'm start? Fran Miller. I'm state senator. Uh, we've been told in Georgia about 25% of the people in Medicaid are blind, age, disabled, but it's 60% of the cost. I want to know how you've dealt with that in Florida with your Medicaid reform, because that seems to be, from a standpoint of the big area right now that, we, that we're focusing on, because that's where all the dollars are, and we're trying to get better outcomes, but we're also trying to cut costs. I just wonder what you all have done in Florida, North Carolina, et cetera, with those, that particular population. That's a great question. That is a great question. Um, while we were working on the five-county reform, we went through an aggressive process of working through a nursing home diversion program to keep people out of nursing homes. Medicaid largely has become, uh, in many states, the largest provider of nursing home services. So while the nursing home industry is not real wild about nursing home diversion, as you might uh, imagine, um, from a quality of life standpoint, and think about your, your parents and your grandparents, where do you want them to be in their elder years? You want them to be in a nursing home? Would you rather figure out a home and community-based service for them to work through? Certainly at home, their quality of life, their social life, all those types of things. And so through nursing home diversion and also through rolling out a long-term managed care program that we could say, look, um, I know there might come a day where you need to go to a nursing home. But man, I bet you, you don't want that day to come soon. So let's figure out how to improve your health and also find a way to keep you in your home so that you're not going to the nursing home. We uh, let those contracts um, uh, at the end of the year. That process is rolling out now uh, to go statewide, and we're exceptionally excited about that because at the end of the day, uh, it is about that patient. I think about my grandparents. You know, my grandparents passed away in a nursing home. That was horrible. It was horrible to see, horrible to witness. I don't want that. The longer they can stay in their home with their friends, their families, their neighbors, all that social interactivity, their places of worship, and that's, that's where it's at, and that's what we focused on. Carol? And, and I think what you're seeing is more private health plans and managed care companies are focusing on the, what we call the ABD population, age blind and mm -hmm. disabled, and also the dual eligibles, those individuals that are eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid. 
And the, the federal government is trying to help with that. The, it's a struggle between Medicaid and Medicare. I mean, they just don't talk very well together. But um, we are moving and making progress with that population. You have to deal with that population. So in North Carolina, we were very clear that you had to do all groups, no carve outs, and everybody was included. And you, you do things like nursing home diversions. Nursing homes are appropriate places for certain level of care patients. And, and I used as an example, a person who breaks a hip goes into the hospital, and I know there are probably hospital execs in here, so if I offend you, I apologize ahead of time, but generally that, that woman, let's just use a woman, goes into the hospital on the third day when the DRG starts to run out their payment policy, then the hospital discharge planner is get out, get out, get out. The family is stressed. The, the person in the hospital is stressed. And the only thing they can get in a short period of time is that nursing home stay. Well, if we had a care manager that could start at the day that that woman goes into the emergency room with a broken hip and looking at what is her social setting, does she have the support she needs, can we wrap services around her in her home, or can we put her in a rehab facility, then move her to the home? If we're thinking through that from day one, then when day three gets there, you've got a plan of action and a care plan. It's a lot calmer for the family members. It's a lot calmer for the hospital, in fact. And it puts that individual in the right level of care, which may be a nursing home. But it also could be back to her home with services wrapped around. One, one follow-up then on that? Are you doing, for this age-blind and disabled, are you doing fee-for-service or managed care with this particular population group? Representative Hudson. In uh, long-term care, we are doing um, um, a managed care model. Um, now, our disabled population is a little bit different. We're, that's a separate agency through the Agency for Persons with Disabilities, and they have uh, an independent directed uh, budget program based on their individual needs. The patient is given an allocation they then in turn are able to direct the care that they need. Uh, and so it's, it, it's very much patient-centered uh, at that point. So that's something kind of different than maybe what y'all are talking about. Other questions? First, Representative Hudson, let me uh, give you accolades for the leadership that you have provided in Florida. As y'all have implemented the Medicaid reform, there have been significant commitments that you've made at a policy level, both short-term, strategic, and long-term in your approach. Uh, your provider service networks that have included federally qualified health centers that have traditionally produced results with your Medicaid population and understand that to allow them to be a provider service network, I think has been part of what your early successes have uh, been realized. Your low income pool directed toward primary care from your disproportionate share hospital funding uh, and match. So you've done some very innovative things and you're to be applauded for that. And I think that the people of Florida uh, certainly owe you a debt of gratitude. I'd like to ask you to, uh, share a little bit, as you mentioned, workforce and the availability, <clears throat> excuse me, particularly in rural areas, and as I heard you reference uh, the integration of mental health and the importance of oral health on physical health, all of this is interconnected. And the decisions that are being made today in terms of how we approach care delivery and outcomes in a vulnerable population can have a long-term impact on reducing the aged, blind, and disabled population two decades from now. So what our lawmakers and policymakers here in Georgia are faced with are decisions on the front end that are going to improve health, reduce disability, reduce costs, improve people who are able to work and earn a living rather than being on disability or SSI. So I hope that you can share a little bit of a window of how Florida has aligned your and taking some of the bureaucratic barriers to allowing the workforce issues to be addressed. And specifically, I'd like for you to uh, share how in Florida you have a very robust approach to oral health uh, preventive services for children and how you utilize dental hygienists and certified dental assistants to be able to deliver cost-effective care. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, thank you for your uh, kind, uh, kind words. Last year when we were debating the Medicaid expansion, 
uh, we did a lot of analysis as to why, and you know, you could have a you could have a very philosophical approach to it uh, that is based on partisanship if you want to. Mine's very pragmatic, frankly. Um, and when you look at it, you, you recognize that workforce challenges. This year, the speaker uh, put together a select committee on workforce uh, and healthcare innovation. So one thing I would tell you is if you've thought we've done a few things thus far, you haven't seen anything yet, okay? Because as far as I'm concerned, um, it's kind of like Sears. There was a day when Sears thought they were the, the biggest retailer in the world. They never had to change because they were number one. Well, guess what? Then came this little company called Walmart. Where Sears, okay? And so if you remain status quo, there's gonna be a problem. And so we're looking at um, advances in uh, telemedicine. We're looking at uh, how we can uh, incentivize practitioners to go to other areas. In fact, our Medicaid reform ties urban areas to rural areas to increase access and develop greater panels. We're also gonna look at scope of practice. And I will tell you that Florida, frankly, um, is reasonably abysmal when it comes to scope of practice issues. And if you're reasonably abysmal, basically you're abysmal, is what that means. And so uh, we rank almost dead last in our scope of practice issues. We don't generally allow our practitioners to do anything other than what the Florida Medical Society says they think they ought to do. And I'll be honest with you, they're not real big fans of mine. And so we're going to aggressively go after how can we allow our practitioners to, to practice at the level of their training. That will allow us to open up other markets for recruitment of practitioners into the uh, state. Um, uh, I tell people all the time, I go, you know, if you're a practitioner in Nebraska and you're thinking about moving to Florida, why would you do that? Well, number one, the beaches are horrible in Nebraska. <laughs> number two, we have great beaches. Okay, there's got to be something else. So I could practice here, and now I want to come to Florida and practice. How long am I going to have to work to start over to get my practice level back up? Well, when they look at what we allow them to do, they, they can't get there. And so we're going we're gonna to work very diligently on that. To a couple of your other points, we interacted with our universities that provide uh, dental training to create a series of uh, dental health clinics around the state of Florida, uh, sponsored by the University of Florida predominantly, although I'm not a fan of the swamp lizards. Uh, <laughs> I, will, uh, I will say that they do uh, good work there. Um, and they've, they've created a tremendous amount of outreach. We've also done some things uh, to provide um, opportunities for children to receive eyeglasses. Um, you know, when you think about the educational program of your state, uh, and you've probably got some metrics and standards in place to make sure there's accountability, but if that kid can't see the board, it really doesn't matter. And if so, if their education is horrible, and then other things fall apart, or maybe they get a degenerative eye disease, You've got, a, you've, got a, you've got a bad problem heading down. So we, we do eye screenings in every single one of our schools across the state of Florida, and we have a program designed so that low-income children can actually have a screening on site, get a pair of glasses, and have them fitted on site. And they get two pairs, one for school, one for home, so that it always is there. And that way, uh, that kid's getting a better education, and we are uh, being, no pun intended, visionary in as much as we're trying to prevent some of that stuff uh, down the road. I think just to highlight one of the points you made, you know, we're talking about the different types of private plans. Uh, Representative Hudson talked about how Florida does specialty plans based on individuals that have either certain conditions, diseases. Georgia has just moved in this direction with a specialty plan for uh, kids in foster care. Uh, but Florida also has these provider-led plans, either led by FQHCs or physician practices or hospital systems. Mm -hmm. And so it's all different levels of competition, all competing on who's doing the best job for the patient and all of them have the same fixed cost, so they're taking on that risk, not the taxpayer. I well, think we have time for maybe... And, and oh, let sorry, me just add one point, too. One of the interesting statistics I've noticed, when states move to a capitated managed care plan, they also see an increase in the providers and the number of providers willing to participate in the Medicaid program. And a lot of that has to do with the managed care plans work to lower the administrative burden for providers and to make it easier for them to provide services. And they can pick how many of the volume of services that they want to provide. So it's an interesting statistic that I've picked up in a couple of the states that I've looked at that they actually do expand the provider base beyond just the mandated requirements. And they can, the providers can negotiate their own rates higher than exactly. the service rates. Exactly. We have time for one more question. I yeah, this, I'm Tom Rice. I'm a state rep. Uh, and I've been through this several iterations-wise, going all the way back to the 2000 time frame when we 
you know, we put copays in the into this population and things like this, and tried all, a number of things for cost effective delivery of these things. But I guess what I've heard, I've heard one number that, I'm, that, that I think you gave me, which said uh, there's an 11% uh, reduction in overall. I think that's what you said in eight the over. Eight to ten, eight, yes. Eight, oh, eight to, I thought it was 11. <laughs> it was 11 a half an hour ago. You legislators <laughs> have the way of doing that. Everything kind of creeps up on savings, yeah. <laughs> But I mean, you know, it is an expanding uh, sure. number, mm -hmm. and just of the service line. And we've tried things like uh, case management for the chronic diseases, of diabetes, and heart disease, and things like this. And it's, you know, you think it's working, but this obviously could work better. The question I really have is, what metrics do you have that you project into the future to say whether this is going to be as successful as it needs to be or not? Well, in North Carolina, we haven't implemented anything yet. They're still in the design discussion phase. Um, but there have been a variety of states that have implemented full managed care, capitated managed care. And, and I'm glad you, that was a great question because the metrics are critical. And what you're looking at, when I mentioned earlier as an engineer, which I am not, you get what you design. And if you don't have the right metrics and looking at the right outcomes measures, then you, you're not able to look at whether your program is a success. So that is one of the, the critical issues and how you look at what is success. Is it that you've lowered the infant mortality rate or that you've lowered the preterm number of preterm births? Those types of issues are critical in the design. And there are a variety of states that have been very invested in managed care that show very significant successes both in outcomes and reducing the budget over what would normally be expected. Um, I don't know if, if Florida has those numbers. Well, we've, we've got a number of different things. Uh, obviously, there's, you know, when you talk about managed care, and there's a lot of naysayers on managed care, obviously. There's people that want the status quo with fee-for-service and all the fraud that goes with that. But with managed care, you can still have issues. Um, you can have somebody spending too much on care and not managing somebody's care particularly well. You can have somebody spending too little on care, uh, trying to profitize and um, you know, not take care of that person. So adhering to a good uh, measurable manage, um, medical loss ratio is important to make sure that that person is not getting uh, too much or too little. Also, uh, we look at the encounter data to know what people are actually doing so that they as the plans have to provide us the data to tell us what they're actually doing with the patient on that per member per month fee. That way we can also see, are they over utilizing? Are they doing those different things? And then there's a myriad of different, um, different healthcare metrics that you can look at, whether they're coming from uh, the feds or HEDIS, but we have a fairly robust system in Florida uh, called Florida Charts where we track everything. It's available to the public. Uh, they can see how things are performing, how their individual counties are performing, how their communities are performing, whether it's infant mortality or any other different things. We make that available to people so that they can start to see it. Um, and really, it's, it's also a question when they come forward and say, well, we need more money. Really? I, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, you also have to have some leadership to be able to say no. And um, at the end of the day, you're going to do it for what you said you were going to do it for, and that's how that works. Well, do you expect the rate of increase to, to, to decrease in terms of Yeah, I think problem? it will. I think, you know, obviously you're going to have a, a rollout period of time. You're not going to go presto change or turn everybody on in 67 counties at one time. So we've got a rollout process. Um, what we do in Florida, we produce a long-range strategic outlook for the state that is a three-year plan every year, and it's, a you know, reinvented every year. This year we did not um, include any savings from the uh, Medicaid program into our long range plan. Now, we anticipate there to be some savings, but uh, until we roll it out and can actually see where we're at, we, we didn't project that because we don't want to give a number that's six and have all the you know, people beating us up because it was four, or we don't want to say 10 and have it be eight. You know? So from our standpoint, first and foremost, we got to roll out a program. We got to make sure the patient's taken care of. All that other stuff is going to come. We have no doubt because the pilot worked. And one of the other important components that, that we haven't talked about, though, is the grievance procedure for individual members. Mm -hmm. That's another safety check yeah. for the system doing the right thing, is a very aggressive grievance and, and appeals process for the members that are involved in managed care plans. And, it's, and it's, if I can add one last thing, and I know you didn't <laughs> want me to. Um, part, of the, uh, part of the rollout of this and part of the talking about this, if you decide to transform it, man, 
do it in the sunshine. Make sure everybody knows what you're trying to accomplish. Make sure that your Medicaid agency is out there holding lots of public hearings. And let hear from everybody. There are going to be a lot of the naysayers there. Don't let that dissuade you. But don't restrict anybody's ability in any region of your state to have an opportunity to talk about it. Because if you do, that becomes a very challenging uh, uh, issue for you in actually rolling it out. Give everybody their say. Hear what they have to say. Learn from it. And you'll have a better program. We also have some research on our MedicaidCure.org website looking at other states that have moved in this direction and the Florida pilot. And we'll be working closely with Kelly and the Georgia Public Policy Foundation to provide similar analysis. The one pager highlights a little bit of that. Uh, it, it's 10 o'clock. I'm getting <laughs> the sign. Uh, I just really want to thank our panel, Moist, Matt, Carol. Thank you so much for your time, sharing your wisdom.